Welcome everybody. On behalf of this section on supervision and training of Division 17 of the American Psychological Association, we welcome you to our webinar entitled, Now What? Navigating Clinical Supervision and Training During COVID-19. My name is Heidi Hutman. I use she, hers pronouns. I'm an assistant professor in the Counseling Psych Master's Program at Temple University. I'm also chair-elect of our section and membership chair of the division. I'm so excited to be able to provide this opportunity for supervisees and supervisors alike to get support and participate in some much needed dialogue about the ways in which the pandemic has really supervision and training. Much appreciation to Dr. Lisa Ferdinand, our own current uh, section chair for her assistance in coordinating the webinar and to Dr. Asmita Pensi, our section webmaster and the SCP webinar coordinator for her behind the scenes webinar assistance and coordination today. It's a privilege to be joined by our esteemed panelists, Drs. Heidi Zetzer, Carmen Riva. Dr. Zetzer is a teaching professor in the Department of Counseling, Clinical and School Psychology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And she is also the director of the Hosford Counseling and Psychological Services Clinic and the Carol Ackerman Positive Psychology Clinic. She is the past president of the Association of Psychology Training Clinics, and she's the past chair of supervision and training. Dr. Cruz is an associate director and director of Texas Women's University Counseling and Psychological Services. She is the current president of ACTA, the Association of Counseling Center Training Agencies. Dr. Riva is a professor and training director in the Counseling Psychology Program at the University of Denver. Dr. Riva is currently the president-elect of, of CCPTP. So as you can see, our panelists are very well positioned to be able to share their reflections and thoughts on how COVID-19 has influenced how we are approaching supervision and training across various settings and with trainees of stages of professional development and from diverse backgrounds. Our goal here is to really have a very informal, productive discussion. And so we're gonna start by just having our panelists share their recent experiences and perspectives, um, both in their particular work settings, as well as uh, with regard to their specific organizations. Um, and then we're gonna move on to take uh, questions from attendees uh, so that we can kind of best meet your needs during this hour. I also wanted to just share a brief note. Um, you know, we know that we are putting a lot of pressure on technology these days, a lot of pressure on the internet connections. If any of us kind of cut out at any point, um, we will try our hardest to get back to you. And if you cut out um, and want to rejoin, we welcome you to do so. And also this webinar will be recorded and available via the Division 17 YouTube channel uh, when we are all done. So that's it on my end. It's so good to see all of you today here and healthy. Um, I wanted to kind of start by asking for perspective. How are you all doing with this? Maybe uh, Carmen, do you feel like you might lead us off in sharing kind of how you've been handling things both at work and also in your organization? Where are you all at? Okay, unmute myself. Hi, everybody. Good to see people uh, joining us for this discussion today. So let's see, broad reflections. Um, you know, I think that one main training perspective that has been helpful, I think, to hold on to in all of this upheaval is that timing was a little bit more on our side than if this would have occurred in the fall <clears throat> with a training cohort. Um, that we knew better already. I think the challenges that we're starting to face from more thinking about the fall and what does that mean with new cohorts and how do you onboard people that have never done therapy to start doing telehealth? I think those are the <clears throat> bigger questions now that are starting to emerge. But you know, we made it. We are <laughs> strong counseling and clinical psychologists and hybrids of both who are working obviously to create you know safe and productive training environments. Um, so one reflection for sure is timing is on our side. And I think we had a good idea of who was doing, like what developmental level people were at, um, about two thirds ish into the training year, I guess, into the academic year. Um, and so I, I feel very grateful about that on a regular basis. So I don't know how we would be managing that if it were dif different. I think that a very broad perspective is most university counseling centers have um, in a period of two weeks obviously changed everything a clinic that was in person to an online clinic 
which bravo for everybody across settings. I know that that's happened in department clinics, um, yeah, in UCCs, and there's still a lot of university counseling center staff in certain states that are still going in, especially in the middle of the country, that they're on a skeletal system still because they're not as infected as the coastal areas um, and other cities. So, so I think that that's really something to applaud for everybody because that's been very stressful personally and professionally. You know, I think ACTA members have been reporting um, feeling very supported by each other and membership on the listserv. I think that's been a lifeline for a lot of people, um, sharing ideas, sharing forms, all the things during the initial, especially the initial stress. It seems like now people are settled into the practice and now new questions are emerging, right? So like we've gotten our telehealth down, um, the direct service question for interns. So I think this is also, if another thing I've noticed is if you're talking about practicum therapists, interns like doc interns or postdocs um you're you're having somewhat different conversations because of the academic requirements and things like that and so specifically acta we're dealing with pre-doc interns um, at university counseling centers for their internship and so a big um issue has been how do we get them to reach their 500 hours of direct service and so a lot of training directors have been um, trying to be creative around giving interns extra projects and things like that to create like future PowerPoints or future videos for, for students to have for the student population. Um, and so I think that's been working out pretty well. Again, I want to make it very clear that with the COA, the Commission on Accreditation Guidance, CCTC, all the training councils, Related to internship, it's important that training directors embrace their power of assessment of student competency and be okay with endorsing a certain student at the 500 hour mark, even if they had 483 hours. That training directors have that power to make that assessment, to decide that, <clears throat> excuse me, that they're gonna sign off, because like, there's a lot of anxiety around that and it makes sense that there is that anxiety about should I write this if they didn't get their 500 hours and um, how are they gonna be able to get it during telehealth or enough clients going to you know, sign up for service. And so far we're finding that we're on the upswing of a lull of clients, of students calling in and now it seems like more and more um, hours are being attained, which is good. And then my final comment is probably a little bit more emotional around um, you know, checking on our supervisees, there's been a lot of emphasis on that, which is great. And we're, we're there for our supervisees and we want them to know that the training team is behind them. I also say check on your supervisors, you know, because I think sometimes they can get lost in the shuffle. Um, and I know I've been trying to do that with our team at Texas Women's University and checking in with them, but to make sure you check in with your supervisors as well. So I'll stop there so I can pass it over to Heidi or Maria. Thank you, Carmen. Um, appreciate you speaking to multiple pieces around, um, you know, where we're at right now and where we might be in the fall, as well as how to kind of work levels of training and to not forget, you know, the people providing the supervision in kind of checking in and including, um, you know, your consideration of how different people are doing and making sense of this. Maria, do you want to share kind of how on your end? Sure, thanks. Um, as a training director, I have, Carmen, I think, hit a lot of really important points. Um, so our students um, in the program, in practicum, have had all kinds of different experiences of being required to be at sites, um, not being allowed to be at sites, learning telehealth, learning uh, group telehealth. Um, and so I think that they have been pretty stressed, but I also have been really impressed with the sites in Denver, who've been really willing to be flexible and come up with plans. Our students in, um, out in internship, we have nine, I mean 11, and nine of them are in counseling centers and they have all, all the sites have been fabulous, but the counseling centers, I want to say, have been just really fabulous in terms of the amount of communication with me, um, with the students, um, and that's been just great, flexibility, um, which has really helped some of the students' concerns, for sure. 
as the president-elect of CCPTP, um, the training directors are quite concerned and we had our conference canceled. Um, and I think that for me, what I'm seeing is that really what they need is support. More than anything we did, and so what we've done in CCPTP is to try to organize ways that we can communicate with them and provide support. And one was a town hall meeting that was last week, which was incredibly well attended and um, a lot of opinions and concerns and strategies um, shared. And then we decided to have support groups every week in April and every other week in May, we may change that. But if one person shows up or four people show up, we don't really care. It's really important that we make that available, um, I think, to the training directors who have so many questions. And I think it's a little difficult because states are different um, and their rules are different. So um, it's um, important to hear how, and, and the settings are different too. So the VAs are different, obviously, than the counseling centers. So that's hard to keep up with too. Um, for me, I think that um, <laughs> having we're on quarters and so it's been also interesting to start a new quarter in the middle of this and then prepare two new classes um and what i found is that's been really helpful for <laughs> first of all I, I i i learned how to zoom and i'm really excited about that the classes are going well but um what i've learned is that also the more contact I have with our students, the most more helpful it is, and not necessarily to always say, how are you doing? But just to provide them with some information um, about the class or about what's going on you know, in, in the country um, so they don't feel overwhelmed. It's a balance, I think, that, that makes it hard for all of us. And I wanna just add, I think also we really need to focus on us and staying healthy and, and be able to balance our own anxieties with students. And so ways that we can do that and support each other, I think is really helpful also. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, you know, I, I think that you elaborated really nicely on some of the stuff that Carmen's speaking to. Support goes always, you know, both for students as well as faculty. Um, and that folks are really looking for contact and connection and some anchoring to give them a sense of kind of what they're doing on a on a day to day basis. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Heidi, how have things been going on your end? Heidi, Heidi to Heidi. How are things been shaking out at the beach? <laughs> um. Well, I'd like to first share that this is an image of the bluff tops at Santa Barbara, and I have it there to remind everybody to go outside uh, and to really tend to our uh, physical and emotional needs. And it is okay to go outside uh, and engage in physical distancing, um, but we really do need to nourish ourselves in ways that perhaps we did in a more intentional manner because before we didn't have to do that, we were outside walking to our cars or going to the grocery, and now that's all more restrictive. Uh, so I can speak to uh, the recent president, now past president of the Association of Psychology Training Clinics, uh, what happened nationally and kind of internationally because we have Canadian members and there are a few Australian members as far as doctoral level practica. And there's been a huge scramble in those trainings to go to telehealth. So virtually 96% of the clinics we surveyed, about half of our membership responded. There's three clinics in the membership have gone to telehealth and quite quickly. And some had a small start on it and others had not done anything at all prior to the advent of the coronavirus. So uh, there was a huge buildup. And I think one thing that's so notable about this is it shows the capacity of all the folks who are in these leadership and training positions to kind of work with what you've got and then draw in as many people as you need to make decisions about how to ethically and responsibly and technologically and astutely provide these telehealth services uh, to, in order to sustain client, client care and also to sustain training, right? And so the listservs, I, Carmen and Maria both re referred to those, are tremendous resources. And I'm just so grateful to my APTC colleagues because folks are very generous, are very willing to share 
handbooks and strategies, uh, wisdom about technology and so on. Now, the thing for students is they don't see that all that happening, right? And for them, they were in this morass of ambiguity for a while. And partly, at least my strategy was to tell them when we had accomplished some movement in a particular direction so they don't see all the different permutations. And I think that probably increased their sense of, of unease, right? And so over the course of time, I think one piece of wisdom I would share with folks is for the, those of us in leadership positions, especially when it comes to accruing hours towards licensure or hours towards applying for internship, to synthesize the information that's there and present it in a digestible chunk to students and create a space for them online to talk about it. Uh, so that they don't have to track all of the changes in licensure and all that kind of stuff, but periodically we just present kind of a thoughtful, helpful uh, state of affairs and then give them some space to talk. Um, and I think also a lot of the training clinic folks are also DCTs and work with Practica like you do, Maria, in the community. And those agencies have also scrambled towards telehealth. And some have very few resources, right? They're these tiny nonprofits and they don't have the revenue to get the care that they need. And they're also serving clients who don't have computers, even smartphones or wireless internet or a place to live. So the challenges presented here are quite significant. And the thing that's so impressive and just moves my heart is the folks in leadership roles are pull all of this together and balance out the needs and take care of everybody. And it's a process as this whole uh, pandemic that we're in unfolds and the conditions change. So we're having to keep ourselves open to possibilities for a longer period of time than we're used to. And that's very, very draining. And I'll just say one more thing and then I'll be quiet, <laughs> is that I've noticed at least uh, among, for myself, the things that have tended to drop away seem unimportant, like the maintenance part of relationships because we're trying to get tasks accomplished. But those maintenance parts are really critical. So I think we still need to present awards to people. We still need to have some kind of ritual that marks movement to internship or graduation or something. Even if it's tiny, we cannot just leave those be because it's too much of a loss in the face of so many losses, right? We support the part of our colleagues, students who need that kind of meaning. It, we they have to sustain the meaning. So that's just, those are my thoughts on that. Thank you, Heidi. Um, I, I think with, we're going to have a lot of questions in a minute um, about some of the that you are all speaking to. Um, that's just so important. And Heidi, you really touched on just the the kind of issue around information consumption. How much information? When when to give that information? Um, how to let people know that you're trying really hard to get this together, but you may not give them kind of a play-by-play -play, and that might be in their best interest and really to how quickly um, telehealth has had to kind of come together for some sites and how there are disparities and um, differential access, uh, both for clients as well as for sites and uh, communities at large. Well, I really appreciate hearing from each of you. I'm gonna go now to take some of the questions um, that we can you know, start to have a conversation um, with, with our attendees who are hoping to kind of hear from you about ways that you're approaching some of the things that they're grappling with. Um, the first question is about how you are handling information overload and the rapidly changing protocols for telehealth. Does anybody want to take that first? I mean, I can start us off. Um, just definitely want to validate that statement 125% because the first few days there were just few resources just because we were all creating them <laughs> and, you know, trying to work on them. And then suddenly it was this influx of then this webinar and this webinar. And the last thing somebody wants to do is be on a webinar. So thank you, all the people here. 
Um, and so <laughs> what we end, what I ended up doing was I need, this is a more very practical procedural, like how to deal with the overload or what the question is, um, is as a team, we created uh, a Google Drive and aside from like our typical storage system, because then you don't know, are you gonna have access to that? What's gonna happen? So if, like, if Google blows up, then we have bigger problems, you know? So like on the Google Drive, it's safe for the most part. And so um, we just, that way we just put everything in there and then we can decide when I'm gonna go need to write something, I'm do the group therapy consent form. I'm gonna go in to see what I have. So it's like, put it away, and then when you need it, and at least that's some of the coping we've done on our team, um, is to sort of store it and then use it as needed, um, and try to separate out like, what's a resource, what's an emotional resource that's usually for clients, but now it's really for humans, for all of us in terms of our own coping. And so having a separate space for resources that are more about the emotional process of this experience together, um, and then things that are like the practical, here are forms, and then here are other technology related things, like which platforms are HIPAA compliant, which ones are not. <clears throat> so that's just one perspective in terms of from a practical place that could be helpful so that you're not feeling like, like oh my gosh, and my email is still overwhelming me, you know? Kind of put it, create a folder in your Outlook or wherever and COVID 2020 or COVID I hate you, whatever you wanna name it <laughs> and go back and have all your stuff there. <laughs> all right, I'll Thank you, I appreciate your suggestions for what to name the Others, do you wanna, do you wanna kind of um, speak, speak to that question before we move on? Heidi, it looks like you, you wanted to share. Yes, I'd love to. I just wanna add to Carmen's wisdom and sense of humor there. It's really, it's really important to keep a sense of humor. <laughs> uh, there's a few things that I've learned. It's so interesting. We're all having to learn so many new things so quickly. And uh, one is to have a team. Carmen, you mentioned a team. And the team may not be the team that you're used to. Uh, so I've had to work more directly with our campus IT strategist. And uh, he's been fabulous. I'm not even going to name him. His name is Doug Drury, UCSB campus IT strategist. And I've gotten not only technical expertise but also he's stabilizing i don't know if in his work he's had to deal with technology crises that are not psychological crises but somehow he's very calming so i'm so glad to be able to work with somebody who's not to manage students and clients and that overall feeling those folks need a break we can turn towards the people who aren't so directly affected by the impact on human, the, the human emotional kind of component, right? So it's not his job to care about clients, it's his job to fix our technology problems. And that's been a great relief. Uh, also, there are things that I have recognized about myself. So under stress, I get very focused on details, which is not really my nature. And so I've been torturing other people with questions about how should we do this tiny thing and how should we do that tiny thing? And they literally, look like they're just going to pass out or <laughs> faint on Zoom. So I did notice that. <laughs> and uh, as a result, I've kind of withheld all that decision making from those teams. But I make the decisions and then I turn it over to students who are like much more novel and capable. And so being open to feedback and trying to maintain some flexibility is quite critical. So it's important to know who's on your team, what their strengths are, reach out to other people uh, when you need them. So that's, that's it. Thank, thank you, Heidi. Um, we're getting a question in about creative uh, to help trainees get their direct client contact hours. Even when we were talking about IT, Heidi, before we tackle that monster, yeah. um, can we go back to the, the, something somebody asked about what are, I can't remember what the question, but something about which ones, what platform, so that could be helpful to, since it's a part of what Heidi was talking about. Um, I recognize when you're working with a university versus like a, not, a small nonprofit, like you know Heidi mentioned earlier, um, and other community agencies, we certainly have university counseling center privilege or department clinic privilege to even have an IT person um, to be helpful. So 
for us, it was looking at what does the university already have? Because it was, again, and the upheaval was all like, okay, everybody has to get Zoom healthcare. That's the HIPAA compliant one. And then suddenly Zoom had like a million calls in three days and all this sort of stuff. And so then when we could slow down, the university's like, this is what we have already that's HIPAA compliant, or we don't have anything that's HIPAA compliant and needing to move toward that. So I think it was sort of like a slowing down process and looking at. So the Zoom healthcare is one, um, and this, this, this coincides with recording videos, which could be helpful for to see how you all are also dealing with that. If you don't have a HIPAA compliant platform, um, that's one obviously huge problem. Google Meet is, so for instance, at my university, they had purchased Google Suite or G Suite, which inherently had a HIPAA compliant platform on it. So we were fortunate in that way to be able to move into that. Um, so there are many is the thing. There are many that, that there's not just one, although Zoom is being very uh, used a lot. Um, it isn't HIPAA compliant unless you have the special BAA agreement with Zoom. Um, so that's the, the acronym to look for if you're still looking for HIPAA compliant is you have to have an agreement with the, the corporation that's hosting essentially. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's just to, to share. I think part of it is figuring out what do they have already? And then the recording aspect, however, um, that also people are doing it. I think, I know if you have Zoom healthcare, it already has, you can record within the HIPAA compliant platform. Um, given that we have G Suite, we're able to record on Google Meet and move it into the Google Drive um, and then move it into our secure storage. So I, I imagine, again, this varies exponentially across sites and um, access. So I don't know if Heidi or Maria, if you have other thoughts on the recording sessions. Yeah, thank you, Carmen. You just hit a good four questions for us, so I appreciate that. Um, others, do you want to do you want to weigh in on kind of some of the more logistical pieces around software that maybe mentioned that you you found helpful platforms, as well as how are folks you know managing the recording piece uh, from a you know from a training um, and client welfare perspective. So Maria, do you have something to add or uh, I can also speak to this? Sure. Yeah, I, I can do that. Um, I just want to say that I think that, um, you know, one of my areas is, is group dynamics. And I think that group telehealth has moved slower than individual. And so I think a lot of people are still struggling with that. Um, although I think people are doing, a lot of people are doing it well. And I think that you probably have we probably have a lot of questions or people probably have a lot of questions about how to go ahead and set that up. And it sounds like some, some of you've already figured that out. Um, and so I have asked several um, national people, I belong to um, AGPA, which is also does a lot of groups. And so I think that's an area that we need to get better at and probably push that out a bit more. Um, and I, I not, some people seem to know really well. And I'm Carmen, you sound like you, talked about that maybe Heidi too um, but I do think that that's a an issue that that really um, we could spend a little bit more time on not not now but in, in general there was a question um, about kind of how people are navigating different modalities and recording that um, as well as kind of having that in this remote platform so I, I don't know if you you might be Maria has a lot of experts psychotherapy. Um, others feel free to weigh in as well, but are, what, plat what modalities are you recording um, when you're recording and what are you not and why? So I can add to that a little bit. Uh, the training clinics, right away, there was huge discussion online about what platforms to use. And it's really a blend of HIPAA compliant and not HIPAA compliant, depending on whether you are required to be so. So uh, some entities are not formal HIPAA entities, but act as if they are. So if you are in one of these mixed situations, you need to consult with all the right people. So your IT, your, camp, your attorney, uh, the campus attorney, the uh, risk management office, the professional liability person I have. So there are other ways to, to ensure privacy and also um, manage that online. 
so there's a blend, definitely a blend. Uh, the ideal, the, the US Department of Health and Human Services did relax the requirements. And so a lot of private practitioners I know, maybe they didn't have a HIPAA compliant version, but they wanted to engage in patient care. So they did uh, use other non-HIPAA compliant platforms. I think they're all gonna move that way because as soon as that, as soon as we get out of this situation, then the HIPAA compliant platforms are probably gonna be required again. Now, if you're getting our circulation, really different situation than if you're in a doctoral practicum. So who you are, the context in which you're practicing, teaching and training, really makes a difference. And you just have to vet everything. Like don't vision alone, uh, keep a good document trail and uh, it'll turn out all right. So you need to triangulate your wisdom from the folks around you. Thank you, Heidi. Um, I think that speaking to kind of a community of support and consultation is always important, but especially right now, not making these decisions in isolation and bringing in folks from IT, from legal, um, you know, whatever kind of resources you have at your disposal to be able to inform decisions about training. Uh, I wanted to kind of shift a little bit away from the technology just for a minute. Um, I know that that is on all of our minds. Um, to talk about how, um, how are you thinking about direct client contact hours? We have a couple folks asking about creative ways to help students be able to meet those minutes. Carmen, you spoke about kind of the power to take the power as a, as a training director at the beginning um, in sharing your perspective. So I don't know if others have thoughts and Carmen as well. I could elaborate a little bit. Um... So, and again, this is the university counseling center specific. So when, I, when I'm representing ACTA, so I'm gonna speak from that lens um, while I'm speaking today. So I would say that, and I saw one question of the sites, university counseling centers that are not providing telehealth services. What do we do with, if we have 80 or 100 hours that we still have to have our interns complete? And so that is gonna take an extra amount of creativity outside of clinical service, obviously. So clinical service is one, outreach is one, supervision provision is the other big one. Um, and so I know a lot of centers are having interns pro develop content for now and later. And so that can be substantial amount of hours. It's, it is the same activity. I think some people are also having them present it to the staff so that the, that's direct service. Like I've created content and now I'm going to share it with you. Um, <clears throat> one idea that, and I think Ed asked this question, somebody, Ed Rogers asked this question about what are we going to do for um, onboarding if you have a specialty practicum students potentially starting in June or July versus the fall. Um, and one thing that some sites can do is if you have interns and practicum therapists that you can have your current interns, especially if service is going to drop off, if you're providing telehealth in May or June, you could have them create videos and create guides on how to onboard the practicum therapist. Um, and that way they get also some time in their direct service hours while providing a service for the center. Um, so the practicum coordinator doesn't have to create all of that. And then you're hearing from interns like, this is how you do an intake at our CAPS. This is how you do this at CAPS. And they can create that content to onboard the practicum therapist. So that's just one perspective. Thank you. Very innovative ideas that are still really providing important training opportunities and important services. Um, others, do you, do you have additional thoughts to kind of add about how you're helping your students trainees uh, accrue direct service hours and, and maybe kind of ways in which you're thinking about this as we approach a very uncertain um, fall term. <clears throat> Thanks. I think this takes, this is one of the roles that we really can increase, which is mentoring our students to be assertive and to try to think about all the options that they have. Um, I was working with a student just recently who isn't able to get um, her hours at the site she's at, but in the site that she was at last year, they have a big need for a particular um, language. Um, she speaks Mandarin and so there's a lot of students and so um, she 
checked with the last site to see if there was some options that she could do with that group of people. And they said, sure, and which was great. So, I mean, I think that it take it takes a lot of work on our part actually to mentor, but that's exciting to help them in their professional development also um, to think about some of the options that are available in the community or how they might approach a supervisor or, you know, a site. So um, I've done a lot of that recently, um, which is rewarding because it's worked out okay and they're growing too, I think, in terms of their, some of their skills. Uh, yeah, I'll just add that advocacy is really essential here and both Carmen and Maria have spoken to that. Uh, at, let's see, um, CCTC wrote a long letter with recommendations uh, and uh, that APIC and ASPPB be, think about the impact of COVID-19 on the accrual of hours and to really think more about demonstration of competencies and capabilities rather than however many hours somebody has. So Carmen was alluding to that, you know, is this person ready to be on internship? That's really the question. Uh, and circumstances also vary. So for some of our students, they're, where they are in their program, they're able to make up the hours a little bit later, but others are getting ready to apply for internships. So it's really the DCT uh, advocating and APIC is, I think, has been responsive. The trouble is, and I think this is what frustrates students the most, and probably interns and postdocs too, is that sites vary in their expectations and states vary in their licensure requirements and also the way that they've relaxed them or will unrelax them. So there's a huge amount of unpredictability. And I feel for folks who are in these transitional phases of their professional development. Um, so one thought I have there is to help someone, no matter where they are in their development, think of alternative pathways to the same goal. And I'm thinking of actually Rick Snyder's hope theory because many of our students have been focused on one goal and there's one path and that's the path to success. And now that's being thwarted a little bit. So we need to help them think about alternative pathways or what to do in the meantime, right? And uh, that is something that is better accomplished with the mentor or an advisor uh, or maybe in groups. Um, yeah, and then the advocacy too is really useful. I, I think it's so important to kind of speak to that flexibility and really thinking about how do you get to that goal um, rather than kind of more numerically, like do you have 500 hours or more? Um, you know, I see a couple questions. Uh, one from Amy Reynolds, one from Julia Phillips. Hi, Julia. Hi, Amy. Um, you know, just asking about what you're thinking about for the fall and what might this look like. And, you know, students are, are in transition. They might need to move to, to, be, to start internship. They might not be able to move. Um, sites might not be taking practicum students if the opportunities or systems are not in place. Some sites, I know, have made decisions about like master level trainees will not be allowed here if, if we're in this place, but doctoral level will or, or practicum no, but internship yes. Um, I'm wondering how you're all making sense of what this is gonna look like or not look like or how you're thinking about the uncertainty lies ahead as we think about the fall. You want, I can start us out again. Um, <laughs> well, it's, there are no coincidences, right? Today in our ACTA listserv, there was starting to be discussion about uh, externs and practicum counselors coming in and are people having them or not. So, you know, I think that because uncertainty just consistently breeds anxiety, you know, I encourage us to hold on to the fact, and this feels like a fact, that we don't know anything until two to three weeks before, if that. You know, and so I encourage us as much as possible, which is really, really hard, is like, we'll see. It feels like is the answer to everything, which is very uncomfortable. But I don't know that we have any kind of 
answer that's going to satisfy anybody right now at the national level. And we've been part of big, big conversations, like long days at CCTC talking about how can we be helpful to students, supervisees, supervisors. And, you know, there's only so much that we know. And I think that's the hard part is about the fall. I think at the end of the day, each center and each clinic and each agency is going to have to assess, do we have the bandwidth on our team to be able to onboard, you know, let's say two or four practicum therapists that are going to be first semesters, you know, and that I think that every agency is going to have to sit down and have, and they're not, that may not be a big answer, like that's going to be able to plug and play for everybody. Um, because the issue of a beginning practicum therapist is so sensitive, you know, uh, people don't know generally how they're going to react to being a therapist that first semester, that first year. And so, um, it's a really just sensitive subject, I think. And so I wish I could provide a more direct answer. Um, but in some ways, like we went through and again, small N of one, we did our interviews and said, you know, we don't know what this is going to look like. But at this point, we are doing our interviews for fall practicum slots, you know, and let's see what happens. Um, so it just making that a statement during the interview, I think, can be really helpful, too, of like we're all in this together and just trying to figure it out. And obviously we're all about training and want people to get their needs met and in the highest standard and highest quality way, which we've had to lessen at some level, you know, um, temporarily. So that's just that's, I guess, my not clear answer. You know, I mean, I think it's to the lack of clarity in the situation. Maria, yeah, it's uncomfortable. Ahead. It's uncomfortable. You know, it's uncomfortable to not know and plan. And everybody on this call is an overachiever, overeducated, overachiever, wanting to do things right and know what we need to know. And we don't. And that feels really unfamiliar, similar to what Heidi said. And it's uncharted territory. Um, so I think we're doing the best we can. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to um, also add to what Carmen's saying is that. You know, for training directors, I mean, we have a huge role in terms of helping mentoring, but in this particular case, Carmen's right. I mean, we don't know. And so if we can shorten kind of how we look at life a bit and not uh, look so far in advance and try to really focus on that and provide some structure around that. But also, I would like to just remind us all that we, I mean, I know that I'd like to have the answers. Uh, and sometimes I work too hard to try to find an answer, but I do also think that it's really important for our students and our representatives to really just know we don't know and we'll do the best job we can and provide information when we can. I just think that sometimes we're hard on ourselves to try to solve problems that we cannot solve at the moment. Yeah. I just want to agree out loud. Yeah, absolutely. We're all in this transition phase and we can't we can't see the future um, I will add to that though that many folks who are training directors training clinic directors practicum supervisors have been at it and even the new people been at this long enough that there are some things that we can anticipate but we're this is really far afield. I mean, we're all we've never faced this before. So perhaps being kind to ourselves is really critical. I really like what you said, Maria, about that. Yeah, we can't. Um, I keep wanting to close the Gestalt, like write a policy, and then everything's <laughs> taken care of. <laughs> That's not what life is now. It's hanging in there, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that the modeling. Of, of you all in the roles that you have with the power and privilege of your respective positions, you know, to be able to model, like, I don't know the answer. This is, um, I can hold that. I'm going to try to be kind to myself. I'm going to have some rough moments. And that way your, your supervisees feel like they the same in that space and they can help their clients feel like they can sit with that as well, um, which is so important. You know, I'm looking at the questions and noticing the time and we're, I'm so grateful for all of the great discussion we're having. I'm seeing that there's a theme in, in a lot of the questions um, that's speaking to both on the one hand, how are you supporting your training um, and maybe your staff as well. You know, Carmen really highlighted the importance of checking in with supervisors um, and helping to kind of 
prevent burnout at this time, to be able to help them cope with anxiety over the uncertainty. Trainees are in such different spots, social location wise, like some are, you know, international students have their own um, and things that they have going on in terms of worrying about family at home and being isolated. Um, so I wonder if we could speak to kind of ways that you are supporting your trainees emotionally and then on the other hand, or on the other side of things, how are you thinking about um, skill development and how are you trying to kind of promote competency development um, given our new, our new challenging world? Well, I th one of the things that I've talked to interns and I spoke, I think, during the APIC seminar, uh, webinar about this is that, you know, this intern cohort and this, these PRAC cohorts um, are going to have a different skill set than others that we haven't measured before. Coping in crisis, you know, how to be helpful to reinvent an entire clinic in a week and a half, you know. So how do you quantify that? Do I then put on their direct service like, oh, you got 24 hours for that or you got 30 hours for... You know, you can't really quantify an experience like this um, in a training program. So, um, so I think that's important to say. I think the other piece, there are a few questions about telehealth. I'm going to weave into this answer about support. Um, this, I think somebody, Vicky, asked a couple of times, like, what do you do if you're just starting telehealth? What are some, you know, wise words and what to do? I think that it's going to be different with every client and for every therapist. Because we've had multiple meetings where people, we've checked in, like, how's it going? How do you find telehealth, you know, teletherapy different than sitting with the person? And some people are like, oh, I'm a believer now. I had a breakthrough with a client. I could never thought this would, you know, happen. And then others that are like, yeah, I'm not feeling it yet. It feels like so two dimensional and you don't have like the normal chit chat conversation on your way in or, you know, so there's going to be, I think part of it is supporting them, explaining that it's going to be different across therapists getting adjusted to this mode and I think to allow them you know allow giving them the permission to adapt essentially like we're not expecting that you're going to be doing your best therapy right now you know this is just throws everybody off you're not going to be like okay according to my theory and I'm going to do this beautiful intervention right now you know I don't expect that of my interns to be thinking that deeply right now when they're sitting and they may have little kids at home and sharing space a small apartment with multiple people. So I think looking at them in their context is the most important supportive gesture you can make and creating extra time. Those would be my two primary answers is make sure you have some like student support time or create a special Zoom meeting for them just to talk about, you know, how, like my first one with them, I was like, each of you tell me about your space. What did you do to create your office space, you know, in your kitchen or in your bedroom or you know, allowing them to just have that time. One thing I'm going to do next week with them is I'm going to have them pick an object from their house for us to just connect and tell me about that. You know, just creating relational spaces for them to just connect and express, I think, could be really helpful. I do also think that it's helpful for students not to go in thinking that it's going to be worse. So that for some clients, it's going to be way better. You know, they don't have to travel. They don't have to, um, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, there's some people who it, it's probably a real advantage to, but I think that we really probably want to help students think that it, it's a really positive mode. And for some people, it's going to work better than it, um, in person. So I, I, I think that would be helpful for them to not go in feeling negative about what to expect. Yeah, and I'll just add that I, I think training is really important. We had our students do the APA training. And while it was a lot of information at once, I think it gave them some scaffolding for, you know, what's this going to look like? What do I have to pay attention to? Uh, but the other thing that's critical is kind of the dose effect that uh, I think when we first got started this, everybody thought, okay, we're just going to duplicate our live services on telehealth. But what's required of the therapist is so much more. I mean, they're managing the laptop. They're thinking about, do I have all the consents? Have I covered anything? Who else is in the house? It's just a, a infor, it's information processing overload. And 
one of the things we've just gone into telehealth, one of the things we've discovered is it's not realistic really to do sessions back to back because it's too much. If you've been in Zoom meetings, you know it's exhausting, let alone doing therapy through Zoom, right? So just kind of relaxing expectations so they're more humane, like recognizing this is, this is different enough that it's taking, it's requiring some other kind of energy or attention that we didn't have to do before, trainees didn't have to do before. Uh, so kind of nurturing people to just, you know, be kind again to themselves and not get caught up in the performance aspect of this work. Yeah. Which I will add, you know, to what you said, Heidi, is really important in terms of the performance aspect. I think to reiterate that to trainees is so important because no matter what, they always feel like they're in a double bind of like, you're telling me to be open and honest with everything, but you're still going to evaluate me, you know, so you're still evaluating my performance. So to let them know, like we're loosening, you know, the, our, our perspective, I suppose, or our assessment of you could be really helpful to say directly. Yeah, you, you all raise such important points. Um, think about in particular, like the, the, the implications of sitting, you know, in one space and not moving around and how important it is to stretch a little bit um, to be able to do the work that you need to do and sit with your clients. One thing that um, we haven't talked about yet that I just wanted to devote a little bit of space to um, before we wrap up and I'll, you know, I'll talk about I'll ask you about kind of additional resources as well towards the end. Um, I wanted to kind of name that there are supervisors who are also trainees, right? So we have supervision of supervision. And those folks are kind of navigating a unique positionality, both as trainees as well as, um, you know, budding supervisors and being in kind of the middle person in, in all of the power dynamics that are happening. Um, any kind of thoughts or things that you've done to kind of support people in that unique role um, or considerations, just any words of wisdom for our train our supervisors and training? That one's a little tougher. Um, I'm just being honest. And partly is my, again, small experience of just me, we suspended our practicum at spring, at post spring break. And so our intern, intern supervisors who are supervising practicum therapists, I mean, I'm their super soup um, leader and I'm just trying to use articles and use video from the first half of the semester um, in terms of running the actual seminar. Um, but in terms of, so, I, so I, don't, I don't have really a lot to share in terms of wisdom, in terms of how to support the middle person, essentially, um, in the supervision sandwich. And so I, so I would imagine, maybe Heidi and Maria, if you do know of people who are still providing supervision when they're a supervisor in training, but we don't have as much of that. Yeah, this is this is now just coming up on the list, uh, mostly because there was a suspension of some of that activity, and we're looking ahead to the fall. And this is very tricky because they're so the supervisor, the licensed supervisor, is so distal from the client. And then with telehealth, how are you going to do that? And um, I I do soup of soup myself. I'm not doing it right now, but I was thinking that perhaps, again, reducing the volume and just focusing on one case, maybe, and getting, if the technology is there, because we do need careful oversight when it's often a first-year student who's working with a client being supervised by an advanced student who's then supervised by a licensed person. So there's just a lot of, uh, risk is not quite the right, right word, but, um, a lot of potential gaps is what I could say. So I'd want to be very, very thoughtful and kind of build something where everybody knows what to do. So I think it's a unique situation that's really different than providing services to a client and then directly supervising that therapist. Yeah.
Yeah, so it sounds like maybe there are some specific considerations for, um, you know, supervisors and training. Uh, I'm hearing reduce the volume, hearing also that depending on kind of the constraints that we're under, it may not be possible to have the supervision training that we would have anticipated or envisioned in normal circumstances and that that might be okay as well. Um, I could also see folks maybe providing some more peer supervision and getting supervision on the ability to support their peers uh, and fellow staff in kind of thinking about cases. Um, I know that we've had a lot more questions than we today. I see that as a good sign because it means that this discussion was really important and very much needed. Um, please, please, please consider uh, joining our section, the section on supervision and training. And through that, you do get connected to a variety of different resources, um, including the supervision and training uh, list. And that's a place that, you know, we're always glad to have more conversation about these and other issues related to supervision and training, especially amidst kind of the current pandemic uh, that we are kind of all navigating together collectively. So I just want to thank everybody uh, for joining us today and thanking our panelists, Maria, Heidi, and Carmen for your wisdom and experiences and for making this webinar a productive and hopefully enjoyable experience. Uh, if you would like more information about our section, the section on supervision and training, please visit our website, www.clinicalsupervisor.org, and you can click on the membership link there uh, and join once on that page. Membership is free, um, and you can out with a bunch of really awesome people like all of us, so hopefully you agree. Um, thank you, everyone. Stay well. Again, this recording, this will be recorded, so it will be available via the Division 17 YouTube channel. Uh, please be kind to each other, as Ellen says, but also be kind to yourselves. Um, this is a really challenging time. There's also a lot of opportunity for creativity, opportunity, um, and connection in ways that we may not have known were possible. So I hope that, you know, we can we can make some room for the opportunities that are coming out of our current crisis situation.